appreciate the mothers too. Hallelujah. Mothers, give yourself a hand. There you go. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, how many can? How many is ready to get into the Word? Amen. All right. Let's do this. I'm going to revisit something that I've ministered on in the past uh, in here, but I felt led to to do that today, and uh, hopefully uh, you got a praise left in you. Amen. How many's got a praise left in them? Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21 is where we're going to be. That's going to be our opening text if you want to stand for the reading of the word. And then we'll get into this, uh, <coughs> what the Lord has for us today. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 21, starting with verse 1. Hallelujah. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Sounds like everybody. Everybody else, catch up when you can. Hallelujah. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, uh, and we're reading down through verse 9. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know the thing of the, in anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There's no common bread under mine hand, but there's hallowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread and there was no bread there but the shoe bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord and his name was Doeg an Edomite the chiefest of the herdmen that belongs to Saul and David said unto Ahimelech is there not there under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, uh, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you slew in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it me. Hallelujah. We're going to talk to you from the subject today. Why should I go to church? Why should I go to church? Father, in the name of Jesus, we're asking God that the anointing that's already been in this house continue to flow through this vessel of clay. Think through our minds, speak through our lips, say what needs to be said. God, we bind every demon on assignment, God, to hinder your word, Father. And God, we just thank you, Lord for what you're about to accomplish through the preaching of your word today in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, <coughs> you're about to find out why you should go to church. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me start off by saying you should go to church because the Bible says to. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. What are we doing this morning? We're assembling ourselves together. The Bible says don't forsake it. Amen. 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 Come on now. Hallelujah. Don't lose your praise on that when we just started. Hallelujah. Don't forsake this. Don't forsake what we do on Sunday, Sunday night and Wednesday night. Somebody say Amen. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, <laughs> but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be more committed to church as we see the day of Jesus coming back approaching. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, we need to go to church because Jesus did it. Luke 4, 16. It says, and he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, 
he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. They had church on the Sabbath day under the law when Jesus came, and it was his custom to go to church every Sabbath. Do you want to be like Jesus? Well, then, go to church. Amen. We should go to church because our forefathers of the faith did it. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house, communion and and sharing the word, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so what do we see from the early church? They started off meeting together every day at least. At least every day when the church was first birthed. Hallelujah. And what did the Lord do for that church? He added daily such as should be saved. Are you hearing me? Amen. God is not going to add to a church where nobody wants to come and sow into it and be faithful to it and committed to it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Your church going is a part of what's going to cause people to come in the house and get saved. I don't have time. Hallelujah. Acts 20 and 7. Look at this. It says, upon the first day of the week, this is our forefathers of the faith, the apostles, the early church. Upon the first day of the week, which is Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. Hallelujah. I don't know when he started, but he was midnight preaching. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so what do we see from this? That the disciples, the early church, came together to do communion, and they had preaching and they had teaching on the first day of the week or Sunday. Hallelujah. This is why we meet on Sunday. The early church fathers met on Sunday. Also, we meet on Sunday because Sunday is the Lord's day. Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week on Sunday. Mark 16 and 9 says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Sunday is the day, children of God, that we meet it's the lord's day it's the day we were liberated from sin it's the day that we were liberated from satan and his hold on us and so we celebrate our freedom every sunday come on amen now there are a lot of people that say we should worship on saturday which is the sabbath according to jewish law under jewish law sabbath was the day of rest there was no labor, and it was, it was a day to honor and remember God who created everything in six days and then rested on the seventh day, Saturday, or the Sabbath. And he rested not because he was tired, but because everything was finished. But this was something instituted under the law. We're not under the law anymore. Plus, our Sabbath, amen, for the new believer is on Sunday. Because on Sunday, the work was finished for our salvation. And we no longer have to strive to be righteous. We can now rest in the finished works of Jesus and know that we're righteous because of him. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we go to church because the Bible says to Jesus did it. The early church fathers did it. And we go to church so that offices can be fulfilled. Offices that are designed to bring the church into the unity of the faith and Christ-like perfection. Ephesians 4 and 11 through 14, it says this. He gave some apostles, these are ministry offices, and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for, the for look at this, the perfecting or the completing of the saints. Amen. These offices 
are for your growth and for your perfection, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Church, that's what church is for. And how can these offices be fulfilled and the saints be perfected, edified, unified in faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and get to a place where they're not moved by false doctrine unless we assemble together with men that are walking in these offices? Are you here? And where do you do that? Church. I have an office to fulfill before you that is for your perfection. It's for your completion. It's to bring you into being more like Christ and to keep you in a place where you're not moved by by false doctrine. But I can't fulfill my office if you don't come to church. Amen. Hallelujah. And so... In the body of Christ, you're either walking in one or some or all of these offices that I mentioned, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and you're going to church to help perfect and edify the body. Or if that's not you, you're coming to church to be edified and perfected by these offices. Either way, whether you're up here or in the pew, you're coming to church. Are you here? This institution, this organization, it's not a social club. It's designed to bring the body of Christ into a strong, firm foundation into being more like Christ and being immovable in this last day. Are you hearing me? We need church. I said we need church. Hallelujah. We need church. With the way the culture's going and the way things are are, are being pumped into the uh, in, into the culture and into our ears and into our eyes every day, the perversion and the stuff. And with all the things that that's bleeding into the kingdom of God from the world, we need church. We don't need less church. We need more church. We need more men and women of God to come together and stand up and declare the truth of the word of God. And you need to hear it more than you've ever heard it before in your life. You need this. Hallelujah. Amen. So look at your neighbor and say, go to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. In case some of you have forgotten, we have church three times a week here. Some of you forgot we have church on Sunday night. We do. We have church on Sunday night and Wednesday. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, yes. I want to look at this story of David in 1 Samuel 21 because um, it gives us some spiritual pictures that reveal to us why we need to go to church. Where we are in 1 Samuel 21 is David has been anointed by the prophet already to be king. And the anointing of the Holy Spirit has come on him, and it's starting to work on his life. And he's already killed a lion. He's already killed a bear under the anointing. He's already, uh, excuse me, he's already taken the head of Goliath and delivered Israel under this anointing. He's already been noticed by King Saul, and he's been made uh, King Saul's armor bearer. And he's already begun to fight for Saul uh, in Saul's army. And he's already been playing his heart for Saul under this anointing and refreshing Saul from demons that were troubling him. But here in this chapter, it got to a point that this anointing that was on David's life began to make David seem greater in the eyes of the people than Saul. And so King Saul, being jealous and threatened by David, 
uh, we understand that he sets his heart on killing David. And while David one day is in the palace with Saul and he's playing his heart for Saul, uh, Saul picks up a javelin and throws it at David. And he does this twice. It both times misses David. But from this action, David is finally forced to flee in exile from Saul. He's forced to flee from a country that he's really anointed by God to rule. Think about that, church. This nation that's his nation that he's anointed to rule and destined to be king over, he is fleeing from it in exile like a fugitive. Hallelujah. Understand something today. You will never meet resistance in your life like you will when you start walking in your anointing. And here's David. He's stepped into his anointing. He's being attacked and he's heartbroken. Look at where David's at. In, in chapter 21, he's heartbroken. He's distraught. He leaves his home. He's basically homeless now. And he has nothing with him. And not to mention, he loved Saul like a father. And he was nothing but good to Saul. And he was nothing but faithful to Saul just to find out that Saul wants to kill him. And so look at the rejection that David is going through in his life right now. And so what is David going to do in this season of heartbreak, in this season of, of rejection, in this season of being just on the rock bottom seemingly of life? What's he going to do? First Samuel 21 and 1, then came David to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said to him, why are you alone and no man with thee? Nob, everybody say Nob. Nob was the place that the tabernacle was located at this time. And so when David was in this place of heartbreak, confusion, distress, rejection, the first place he runs is to the house of God. Oh, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. You should come to church not because you got everything together. You should come to church because everything's falling apart. Come on, somebody. Anybody got a witness to that? And there are folks today that are saying, oh, I would come to church. I know you're inviting me to church. I would come to church, but I got some things I got to straighten out first. I got some things that I got to get together first. You ain't coming. You ain't coming, hallelujah, because if, you'd, if you could get them together, we'd have never invited you to church. Matter of fact, if you could get it together, we'd come where you're at. we just forget church, hallelujah, because evidently you got it figured out, hallelujah. But the reason you need to go to church is not because you got everything together and you look good and, you, and, and, and everything's going good in your life. You need to come to church when everything's falling apart because I still believe the church is not the church for the perfect. We're, we're not a mausoleum in here to exalt the perfect. No, this is a hospital. This is where the bloody, broken people that can't walk, that got tripped up in life, that's been attacked, that's been under pressure, that's failed here and failed there, and they're sick in their head, they're sick emotionally, they're sick mentally, and they need a healing. That's where you go. You go to church to get delivered. You go to church to get set free. Hallelujah. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? See, knob, knob, the word knob, it means high place. Somebody shout high place. The tabernacle was in a high place. There was a place in Hamilton when I lived in Hamilton called Gobbler's Knob because it was a neighborhood that sat on top of one of the hills we had in Hamilton. You don't have 
a lot of hills here in Florida. In Florida, it's all flat ground, but uh, up there you had some hills. Hallelujah. And Nob is the top of a high place. The tabernacle that David went to was in a high place. When you come to church, it ought to be a high place. Church ought to be a place that takes you higher than your circumstances. I come to church this morning because I need to get away from what I'm hearing all around me. Anybody witness to that today? When I come to church, my mind gets put into the spirit, and I'm not feeling and hearing the things that the enemy's been speaking <clears throat> to my flesh, and my mind gets distracted from the circumstances going on in my life. I remember when I was parasailing one time in Daytona, I was 800 feet in the air. Air, and I just remember how peaceful it was because I couldn't hear the noise that I was hearing on the ground. When I got up high in that parasail, it was calm. It was quiet. I just heard the wind blowing through my ears, and that's all I heard, and I just remembered how peaceful it was. Church ought to take you to a place in the spirit where you can no longer hear the lies of the enemy. <laughs> church ought to take you to a place where you can no longer hear the circumstances that's going on in your life. How many came today and you got lost in the presence of the Lord and you forgot you were broke? You forgot your back hurt? You forgot that you had issues at home? Anybody like that today? Somebody better praise God that you got a church to go to that doesn't keep you in the same place you were in out there, but it takes you higher. Anybody go higher? here today Jesus oh hallelujah thank you Jesus my uncle used to sing a song called above the clouds and the idea of the song was when there's a storm when there's a storm going on hallelujah in the middle of the day it's dark but that's under the clouds Woo, hallelujah but if he was in an airplane or some kind of something like that and you could ever go above the clouds, above the clouds you'd find out the sun still shining. Ah, uh, y'all don't want to help me today. Hallelujah. God Almighty. I said, well, if you could, if you was in a storm down here, it might be dark. The electricity might be flickering. Uh, the wind might be blowing. It was the other day. Hallelujah. But if you could just go a little bit above the clouds, uh, you find out the sun's still shining. Uh, you find out there is no rain above the clouds. Uh, there is no wind above the clouds. Come on, somebody. Church ought to take you above the clouds. Come on, come on. Anybody glad that you can go to church and get above the storm, above the wind, above the rain? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so here's David. He goes to Nob. He goes to this high place. He's heartbroken, but he gets to a high place. He's distressed, but he gets to a high place. He's rejected, but he gets to a high place. And here's the priest, and he's wondering, why is David, who's a warrior and captain in Saul's army, why is he traveling alone without an entourage? This was seemed weird <clears throat> to the priest. Uh, well, we know it was because he had to hastily flee Saul, and so he had nothing with him because he had to run from Saul, who was trying to kill him. He had no provisions. He had no weapons. He had nothing when he came to church. Oh, y'all ain't, y'all ain't, come on, folks, hallelujah, hallelujah. Did we take too long with our, with our ceremonies, hallelujah? David didn't have anything when he came to church. Yeah, and you may not have nothing when you come to church, but that's why you come to church, because there's some stuff in the church that you need. It, come on. Yeah, he had nothing. He had no provisions. He had no weapons to fight with. Hallelujah. But David not wanting to tip anybody off to what was going on uh, because he knew Saul would be looking for him. He said to Ahimelech, the priest, when he asked him why he was alone, uh, he said to Ahimelech, this is what he told him in verse 2. David said to Ahimelech, the priest, the king's commanded me a business and has said to me, let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee. And what I've commanded thee, I have 
uh, or, and what I've commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants, David told him, to such and such a place. So basically, David is, is fibbing here. He's lying, but he's trying to protect himself because he knows the priest could go tell Saul at any time what's going on. So David says here, well, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on a secret mission. And my men, I got men, but they're just stationed somewhere. And I'm trying to be secretive about this. Look at verse 3. David says, now therefore, remember he went to church with nothing. Therefore, he says, what's under your hand? He says, give me the five loaves of bread that's in your hand or what is there present. And the priest said to David, there's no common bread under my hand because he's in the tabernacle, he's in the temple, but as hallowed bread or the shoe bread from the, from the, from the table of shoe bread, the, the sanctified bread that the priest would have to put into the tabernacle. And if the young men have kept themselves at least from women, David answered the priest and said to him of truth, women have been kept from us these, these three days since I came out and the vessels of the young men are holy and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the, in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, gave him the shoe bread, and there was no bread there but the shoe bread and that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day wherein uh, it was taken away. You need to go to church because the church you're going to has bread in the house. Why should I go to church? Because the church I'm going to has got bread. Oh, hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to go to church for the bread. Oh, hallelujah. For the bread, for the bread. Bread, according to John chapter 6, represents the word of God. You need to go to church because the word of God is being preached there. And you're getting fed the bread of life. Somebody say amen. amen. And also bread, in, according to Matthew chapter 15, also represents healing and deliverance. Jesus referred to the healing and deliverance of the Syrophoenician woman's daughter that was vexed with the devil, he called it the children's bread. Remember, he said, it's not meat. It's not right for me to give the children's bread to dogs or, or, or Gentiles or unbelievers. Hallelujah. Understand, you need to go to church because there's bread in the house. The bread is the word, but it's not just the word. Bread represents deliverance. It represents healing. You need to go to church because there's deliverance going on in that church. There's healing going on in that church. They believe in laying on of hands. They believe in casting out devils. Come on, somebody. Come on, hallelujah. You don't need to go to a church where they're just trying to get in and out, try to get you in at 11 and get you out at 1230. You don't need to go to a church where they're more concerned about their social activities and their dinners and all of that that they've got planned. You need to go to a church because when you go into that church, number one, I'm hearing a life-changing word of God, and number two, there's a noise in that house uh, that might get my body healed. Uh, it might get my child healed. Uh, it, uh, they're casting out devils. Uh, they're raising up folks uh, that have bound up by the enemy. They're breaking chains and destroying the oaks. Is anybody glad there's bread in the house? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Woo! I don't know whose favorite saying this is, but I do feel my help coming. Oh, I feel my help. Hallelujah. God Almighty, you need to go to church because there's bread in the house. And let me say this. The reason there was bread in the house was because there was a priest doing his job. I'm about to say some stuff. It was the job of the priest to make sure that there was fresh bread in the house on the table of shoe bread. Every Shabbat, they were supposed to change out the bread and make sure there's fresh bread. Church, you need to go to church because there's a priest in the house making sure that there's bread in the house. You don't need to go to church because there's a celebrity standing up in the pulpit that's got a million viewers on YouTube. You don't need to go to church because there's a great children's program or because they keep the temperature just right. You don't need to go. Come on, hallelujah. You need to go to church because there's a man of God with a word in his mouth that'll deliver you and set you free. Somebody shout, I'm here for the bread. 
Look at your neighbor and say, I don't know why you're here, but I'm here for the bread. I'm here for the bread. I came in here with nothing and I need some bread. I came in here and the devil was on my back. I need some bread. I came in here struggling and I need some bread. Oh, God, I need some bread. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I said, thank you, Jesus. But notice, ah, notice, notice this. It was against religious customs. It was against religious law. It was against tradition for anyone but the priest to eat the bread. But yet this priest broke tradition. This priest violated religious customs in order to feed David and sustain David and give David what he needed to continue. Let me help you today. You need to go to church because the church that you go to is willing to break traditions and religious customs in order to get you what you need. You need to go to a church that's not so bound up that they've got to sing a hymnal and two worship songs and cut the service service off and move on to the offering and move on to the preaching and get you out. You need to find a church where they ain't got a set list but they say God you better show up today cause there's some people in here that need your glory, that need your power. Are you glad you got a church that's not bound by tradition, that's not bound by religion You gotta find a church where there's a man of God willing to make the traditional people mad. Come on, somebody. You gotta find a church where there's a man of God that's got enough gall, that's got enough Holy Ghost fire on the inside of them to stand up to those bound up in religion and say, I don't care if you don't like what I preach. I don't care if you don't like how I worship. I don't care if you don't like how I sing. I'm gonna obey God because I want the glory. I don't want your praise. I want the glory. I don't want your help. Yeah, you gotta have, oh God, hallelujah. Are y'all all right? You gotta have an Elijah, not an Ahab. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about you got to have an Elijah that's got a backbone that'll stand up to Jezebel. When Jezebel's saying, I don't like how you're doing things. Well, God didn't put you in the leadership here. He put me in the leadership, and I'm going to obey God rather than man, whether you like it or not. We got to have an Elijah that'll stand up and say, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Not an Ahab. Not an Ahab that's just trying to keep peace with Jezebel and gives in to Jezebel and gives in to her ideas and gives in to her ways and gives in to her ways of doing things. An Ahab who's probably got a vision down on the inside that would deliver the city and the area and the region, but he can't let it out because he feels like he's got to give in to that to them people, and he doesn't understand there's a spirit, Jezebel, behind those people. Are oh, you hear me? But you need to go to a church where there is enough faith in that church to stand up to every Jezebel spirit that wants to come in and shut everything down. Uh, hallelujah. And declare that we want God more than we want man's applause, man's approval. Somebody better shout about it today if you're glad you got a church. Where Jezebel can't remain. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say amen. 
That wasn't in my notes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to go to church. Because there's a man of God willing to break tradition just to feed you. <laughs> Are you here? Verse 7, David gets into church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know how y'all are doing in the back. Hallelujah. All these people up front got the praise. I don't know what y'all doing in the back. Hallelujah. But I hope y'all with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it says in verse 7, David got to church. And notice, who's, who, notice who goes to church here. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord. And his name was Doeg, an Edomite the chiefest of the herdmen that belongs to Saul, old Doeg. There's always a Doeg in the church. Let me tell you who Doeg is. Doeg was going to snitch on David to Saul. Doeg was going to snitch on David to Saul about where David was and where he was headed. You'll always go to church with a Doeg. Yeah, there'll always be someone in your church going live that won't be for you. Oh, I should have got more amens on that. Maybe y'all ain't been to church enough. Hallelujah. Woo. There will always be a dough egg in your church uh, that won't be for you, that won't like you, that maybe will talk about you. Oh, not to your face. Oh, not to, they'll shake hands with you. They'll hug you. They might even do a little dance next to you during the worship. Oh, but let them get down to the restaurant. Let them get on their phone and start texting. Hallelujah. And you become the topic of the conversation. And they're not lifting you up. And they're not praying for you. And they're not, they're not encouraging you. No, they're running your name down. And they're talking about you. And they're waiting and watching on you to fail and give up and quit. And, and all when you quit, on the inside, they'll be happy. Oh, I'm, I'm getting too personal. On the inside, they'll be happy. On the outside, they'll be like, brother, sister. I'm praying for you. I hope God turns it around. But on the inside, they're smiling because they wanted you to fall anyway. Oh, but, but, but can I? Oh, can I? Because David wrote a song about Doeg. David wrote a song about Doeg, and it's found in Psalms 52. Oh, hallelujah. And the reason I know it's about Doeg because it says in verse 1 that this is a psalm of David that uh, was wrote when Doeg told Saul that uh, he saw David in the house of Ahimelech or the church. So David wrote a song about Doeg. Can I, can I give you some of the lyrics? Psalms 52 and 5. What, look what it says. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. And he's talking about Doeg. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. Yeah, David wrote a song, and in this song, he says, God's going to pluck Doeg out of his dwelling. But look at what else he wrote. Look down here in verse 8. Look at these lyrics. <laughs> look what David said. But I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. <laughs> I don't know who I'm preaching to. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. And so David said, watch this, I'm going to be planted like a green olive tree. No, y'all didn't hear. Doeg's going to be plucked out. And I'm going to be... Can I help somebody that's ever had a hater? Can I help somebody that's ever met a Doeg? God said, don't worry about Doeg. I'll pluck Doeg out, but I'll plan you. Some of you need to praise God because there's some Doegs that hated you, that didn't like you, but Abby, they ain't here no more. But guess who is here? You. 
Somebody tell the devil I'm still here. Yeah, tell the tell him again. Say, devil, I'm still here. Doeg's been plucked up, but I'm still here. Some of y'all didn't need that. That's okay. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm about to run. I said, I'm about to run. Because I know you all ain't walked with me, but my wife knows and my kids know a little. I've had a lot of dough eggs in my life. And you know what? Those dough eggs, some of them ain't even going to church now. But guess what? I'm still preaching the word of God. I might be in a little country church in the woods of Chiefland, but baby, I still... I'm still playing it. Yeah. Let me say this. David said that I'm planted like a green olive tree. Did you know the green olive tree produces the oil that they put in the lamp to keep the fire burning in the house of God? So what David's saying is here, Doeg, God's going to remove you, but I'm going to keep producing oil. Ah, oh, come on, hallelujah. I don't know who needed to hear that, my God. But Doeg, God's going to remove you, but I'm still going to be here producing oil. I'm still going to be here walking in the anointing. I'm still going to be here getting the sick healed. I'm still going to be here casting the devils out. Hey, somebody give him one more praise if you're still here. Come on. If you've ever ran into a doe egg, I want you to shout this, devil. I'm still here. And I'm still producing oil. Oh, yeah. I wish you'd take about 15 seconds, get on your feet, and give God a shout of praise because you're still here. nowhere and I ain't going nowhere I'm still here oh you might as well go ahead you might as well go ahead shut the shot shut Oh, Maria, la rabosaya. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't let Doeg remove you. Let God remove Doeg. Woo, hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, hallelujah. You may be seated. I'm almost through. Hallelujah. Y'all, come on. Verse 8. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. God Almighty. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can we declare one more thing? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you better keep your eyes on me. There's more to come. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm planted like a green olive tree in the house of God. There's more to come. Oh, I, oh, I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. Can I, this ain't in my notes. Can I say this to somebody to help somebody? Hallelujah. Do you know how they got the oil out of the olives? They crushed it. 
And I want to say to somebody in this house, if you're going through a crushing season right now, don't give up because the only way to get the oil out of the olive is to crush it. Just let the devil know you're crushing an olive tree, baby. And the only thing getting ready to come out of me is more oil. Somebody shout it. There's more to come. Come on, crush me if you want to. There's more to come. Woo. You better watch me today. It's my birthday. I might run all around this church. Woo! Shanalaboshaya. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I could tell you some things. Oh, I could tell you some things. Woo. And David said to Ahimelech in verse 8, And there is not here under thine hand spear nor sword, for I have neither brought my sword nor weapons to church, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you slew in the valley of Elah. Behold, it's here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you'll take that, take it. There's no other save that here. That's the only weapons here. And David said, ah, there's none like that. Give it to me. Ah, oh, Jesus. You need to go to church because you're getting a weapon to fight with. I'm almost through. I'm almost through. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you're going to church because at church you're getting something to fight the enemy with. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Hallelujah. You need to go to church because the priest there has got some weapons that he can put in your hands. Or in other words, he's giving you a word to fight with. In other words, hallelujah, I'm going to church today because when I wake up on Monday morning and the devil decides to walk up in my workplace or the devil decides he's going to work through my boss or the devil decides he's going to stir up one of my family members or the devil decides he's going to come at me on the highway, I need a word. I need a word to fight the enemy with. I need to be able to tell the devil, it is written, devil. It is written. Thus saith the Lord. Come on. Anybody got a... Did you get a weapon this morning? Does anybody feel like that you got something today? You can go out of this house and put the devil under your feet with. Yeah, yeah. You don't need me being lazy through the week. You don't need me. You don't need me spending all my time somewhere doing leisurely activities and then just showing up on Sunday morning grabbing something off the internet just because I spent all my time doing stuff through the week that didn't have nothing to do with God. No, there's families in here that are broken. There's families in here that are going through some stuff and you need a man of God that will say, you know what, I got something for you. If you put it in your mouth and open up your mouth and declare it, you can put the devil where he belongs. Is anybody glad? You got a church that's got weapons. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I go to church for the weapons. I go to church for the ammo. I go to church because I get stocked up for the week. And I know the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But let him come at me after I've been to church. Let him attack me after I've been to church. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. When you walk out of church, before you get to your car, tell the devil, put them up. I'm ready. I'm ready. You Come on, come on, somebody. Do I got anybody in this house? That's ready to put the devil under your feet when you walk out. Yeah, 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 I'm going to church because the priest can put a weapon in my mouth. And notice, notice that this weapon, notice that this weapon was a weapon that came out of a battle. Uh, uh, I only got one more page. I promise I only got one more page. Just a half a page. Notice that this weapon was a weapon that came out of a battle where through faith in God, God was able to bring a victory. Can I help somebody in this place? The word that the priest is giving you to fight with doesn't need to be the word that he got out of some book from some website, but it needs to be a word that was received through trusting God in a battle. I don't want to fight nothing. I don't want to fight with anything. You ain't fought with, man of God. Don't give me what somebody else believes. Don't give me what somebody else did. Tell me what you did, baby. Tell me how you got out of that divorce. Tell me how you made it through that tragedy and that loss. Give me something that you've already proved in battle. Bet that sword had blood on it. I need a weapon that's got blood on it. I need a weapon that's got the evidence that it's already worked and it's already won a battle. Don't give me a prayer preacher out of some prayer book. Tell me what you prayed that got you out. Tell me what you said that got you out. I need a weapon that's already cut the head off of a giant because I'm in need, preacher. I've got a battle, preacher, and I need a weapon that'll work. Come on, somebody. So I'm going to say this. You don't need to go to church where there's a preacher that ain't been through nothing. You need to find a church where there's a man and woman of God that's standing up and they fought demons. They fought devils. They fought darkness. They fought depression. They fought tragedy. But they're still standing. Give me somebody that ain't been to seminary, but they've been through hell. That's who I want. I need a weapon. I need a weapon that's already won a battle. Don't quote me from some book, preacher. Quote from your life. Seth, I got one last thing to say. This was Goliath's sword. A sword that came through a supernatural victory from David trusting in God. This is my last thing, and I'm done. I don't know if you got one more praise in you or not. It's just 1230. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know if you got one more praise in you or not, or if you're ready to go down to the salad bar. Hallelujah. But anyway, let me say this. This sword was Goliath's sword. It was a sword that reminded David. 
Oh, y'all missed it. Hallelujah. You missed a good place to shout right there. Hallelujah. It was a sword that reminded David of the faithfulness of God. It was a sword that reminded David that there's a God that if you put your faith in him, he'll bring you through. Church today, I go to church because I'm reminded that there's a God that loves me, that's been faithful to me. Anybody know a God? Come on. I dare you to get on your feet and praise him if he's ever been good. If he's ever healed you, praise him. If he's ever brought you through, praise him. If he's ever turned it around, praise him. If he's, uh, if he's ever came to you at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, and delivered you, praise him. If he's ever removed the darkness in your life, praise him. I dare you. Praise him. Uh, because church has reminded you of how good he's been. Yeah, 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 preacher. When you sung that song, it reminded me of the time God brought me out. When you sung that song, it reminded me of the day I got saved. When you sung that song, it reminded me of the day God healed me. Come on. Hey. Church ought to remind you of the faithfulness of God. When we sing a song, just remain standing. I'm done. When we sing a song that takes you back to 2010. And it brings you to a moment that you remember clearly of God showing up and the tears start running out of your face. And you'd have never thought about that sitting at home. Miss Denisia thinking about all your problems and crying to your friend on the phone about everything that's going on. But because you come to church... I said, because you come to church, they sung something that reminded you of what happened 10 years ago. And you start crying. And all of a sudden, faith starts rising up in you because you know the God that did that, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And all of a sudden, you come out of your depression and you come out of your fear because you're like, if he did it back then, I know he'll do it right now. Come on, anybody believe it? Anybody believe it? Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, if he did it back then, he'll do it right now. Come on, look, come on, remind them. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, remember how good God's been. But what he's been, he'll always be. Now give him one more shout of praise in this house. Just lift your hands in this place. Just lift your hands all over this place. I'm gonna. Is anybody glad you came to church today? I want you, as you're lifting your hands, I just want you to say, God, I thank you. 